I know what you guys are probably thinking, all great, him again. But I want you to tell you that I choose to hear it as all great, him again. Between uh, Claudia's prayer about God's presence and Julia's community meditation about uh, this veil that, that once separated us from God that's no longer there, I honestly, that's pretty much my sermon. There's a part of me that just wants to call it good and say, let's go get breakfast or something. Um, Steve is sick, and uh, Thursday evening he sent me his notes, and, um, and I tell you, it's awkward to preach another, another man's sermon. It's, uh, it's hard. Uh, he communicates differently than I do, and so I spent uh, about 24 hours trying to rephrase some of the things and put it in the way that I would say it, and as you can imagine, the way that Steve talks and the way that I talk, and just, anyway, this is what you get, and so... <laughs> Um, I want to. I want to spend a minute. I mean, honestly, my first thought when I woke up this morning is, we just need to pray. <laughs> That's. There's no more time to prepare. This. It's. This is a. So let's pray. I'm. I'm serious about that. So God, first of all, foremost, we just want to pray that you help Steve getting uh, feeling better. We appreciate his leadership, God, um, and just all that he has done for so long. And um, God, just pray for your blessing over him even now. And God, that he would be feeling better. My my prayers even today. And um, God, that he'd be back on his feet. And God, I know that it's hard for him to, to turn loose of this just because of, of the great sense of responsibility that he, he lives with. And God, that he, uh, that he takes under you. And it's something that I admire and long for in my own life. And, and so God, just pray that you would be with him. And God, one of the, the promises that we lean into this morning is that your word never comes back empty. That it always accomplishes the purpose that it's set out to do. And so God, I'm standing on that today. And I just pray that you would have your way. In Jesus' name. Amen. So here we go. Um, it's your last chance to go. No. Um, you know, there, I, I was thinking that there, there are a few things in life that not everyone will experience. There's, there, there's a handful of things or maybe many things in life that some of us will go through that, that the rest of us never will. Some of us will never know what it's like to live in a foreign country. Not all of us, probably not many of us, will know what it means to have a million dollars or even close to that. Some of us will never know what it means to own our own homes or to pit, pitch a perfect game, go beeves, or to experience massive debilitating hair loss. No offense, Jason. <laughs> it was Mark last service. I had to go somewhere else. So. But there is one thing for sure, unless Jesus comes back, that we'll all experience, that we'll all go through. Death is one thing that we'll all experience, and there's no way around it. It doesn't matter how healthy or how wealthy you are. It doesn't matter how smart you are or if you wear helmets and pads the rest of your life. Death is certain. In a, in a world that, that has so many things that aren't certain, I mean, death, death is certain. And, and it's interesting to me because it seems like so many people push it away. We, we kind of choose to, to think and to live as if this opportunity that God gives us to leave a godly influence, to invest in kingdom things, to love the people that God has put around us and to experience all that God has for us. We, we, we kind of live at times as if that reality, that opportunity is not short. It is. It's short. And the way that the, the Bible says it is, is that our life is like a mist that's here and then it's gone. If you know what it's like to have kids, you know what I'm talking about. So short. Thinking about death used to scare me, and if I were to be honest and shoot straight with you, there's an element that still does. I used to close my eyes and imagine, I mean, what really? I mean, honestly, what's after this? This physical life that we know, I mean, that What's next? I mean, is it this long, eternal darkness, nothingness, forever? Will I come back in another form and continue this journey? Will I myself become a god someday? Will I be put in a place where every wish that I have is immediately granted? I used to think about these things a lot. I mean, 
I think I said when I was little, I was probably more like 18, but I was still little. Um, and, and, and thinking about those things more and more and more, it got me to the, the place where I was thinking about the reality of, of Jesus. And thinking like that, I mean, it had a huge in, impact on my life. It influenced the decisions that I made at that point a, a great deal. And to be honest, I think it was some of what led me to this point in my life here and now. Steve has been preaching on these face-to-face encounters with Jesus, and it doesn't take us long to realize that wherever Jesus was, I mean, crazy things happened, weird things happened. The kinds of things that people in that day and in that age didn't really know how to handle, they didn't know what to think about it. And they're things that we still talk about to this day. I mean, very few, anything, I can't think of anything that has had the impact on history that those things have had. Even in our present, I can't think of things that have had the impact that those things have had. It doesn't get any crazier, though, than what we're going to talk about today. It was a time in Jesus' ministry where things were coming to a head, and, and Jesus and his disciples, they left Judea because of this growing opposition that they were experiencing from the Jewish leaders. And that's when word came. Mary and Martha wanted Jesus to know that Lazarus was sick and that things weren't looking good. And you can get a feel, if you read John chapter 11, it's where we're going to be out of most of the day, the first 53 verses, and we're not going to read all of that. But um, if you read that and you read other parts of the Bible, you get to realize pretty quick that, that, that Mary, Martha, and Lazarus, I mean, they, they had a special relationship with God. Verse 11 says that Jesus loved them, and verse 3 uh, talks about how uh, Lazarus was referred to as Jesus' very dear friend. And so when Mary and Martha sent word to Jesus that Lazarus was sick, there wasn't any mention of their desire for him to come. Jesus loved Lazarus. They knew that that invitation wasn't necessary. They were confident in the love that Jesus had for them. They knew that he would show up. They knew that he would be there. There's a story of a couple of friends who were in World War I together, and one of them was wounded in battle. He was hurting, and he found himself laying out in the open, helpless, between the trenches and in the midst of the darkness and the chaos, his friend risked his own life, crawled out into the open, exposing himself to danger and death to help his friends. And when he finally got there, he looked in his friend's face and his friend smiled back and he said, I just knew that you would come. And that's exactly how Mary and Martha felt about Jesus. They knew that he would come. He was their friend and, and he cared about them. They knew that he would be there. Jesus was deeply moved by the grief of the the sisters of Lazarus. Jesus was deeply moved by the grief of the sisters of Lazarus. And I love the way that that, uh, the New Living Translation puts uh, John 11.33. It says that Jesus saw her weeping while the other people were wailing with her, and a deep sense of anger welled up within within him, and he was deeply troubled. And just two verses later, it's every middle school kid's favorite memory verse, John 11.35, right, which says what? Jesus wept, the shortest verse in the Bible. It's easy points for whatever you were working toward for camp. And so this picture of Jesus being deeply troubled and this anger welling up within him and, and Jesus weeping. I mean, if you read it in, in verse 4, it talks about, I mean, Jesus knew what was happening. He knew that Lazarus was going to get up and walk out. So my question is, what was it that was troubling Jesus? What was it that was causing him anger over the situation? Why did Jesus weep? I think it was because of his love over these people, his compassion over Mary and Martha and the people that were wailing. And he saw how Lazarus' death hit them and his heart was heavy to the point of anger, not at God, but at death and how it affected them. And this is a picture that God wants us to see of him, of his heart and how deeply he loves us, how he feels what we're feeling, how he weeps when we weep, how he laughs when we laugh. He's not unaware. He's not unable to sympathize. You're not invisible to him. He sees you, he knows you, and he loves you. The Greeks of that day had a a different picture of God than we do. They had a word that they used to describe what they saw as as one of the dominant uh, characteristics of God. It was the word apatheia, and you don't need to be a a Greek scholar to parse that out and to see what it means. Apathy, that's where we get our word for apathy. A total inability to feel emotion whatsoever. They thought that if, if someone felt joy or, gla- or gladness or grief, it was because of the impact that someone else had had on them. And if, a pers- and if a person affected you like that, it meant that, that for that time at least they had power over you. And so that kind of put them in an interesting place. I mean, it got them to the point where 
Uh, they, they, they knew that no one could have that kind of power over God. And so that really gave them trouble with how they related to God, how they saw God. It became easier for them to relate to God as being emotionless, unaffected, and distant. And they didn't know what to do with a God that was over and above all things, but yet would weep and be troubled and feel angry over the hurts of his people. The Greeks believed in a lonely, isolated, passionless, and compassionless God. And read the scriptures and you tell me if that's what you see, because that isn't it. Jesus gave us a different picture. He gave us an accurate view of God and what God's really like. He showed us that God's heart is deeply affected by pain, the pain of his people. He showed us that God in the most literal way is afflicted when we're afflicted. He shows us a God who cares and who feels and who has anger well up when his people hurt and who weeps over our stuff. Jesus was Lazarus' friend and that's the astounding thing is that he's, he's my friend too and he's your friend. He feels the same way about you that he felt about Lazarus, that he felt, feels about Mary and Martha. In John 15, 13 through 15, Jesus says his, uh, to his apostles, that greater love is no man than this, that he lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know the master's business. Instead, I call you friends. And that's his word to us too. We are Jesus' friends. Jesus loves us and we can count on him to come. That's not even a question. Jesus says that no greater, has, no greater love has anyone than this, that he laid down his life for his friends. And I think that Jesus was foreshadowing his death on the cross for us. And, and even more, I think that um, Jesus was talking about the, the stuff that he provides for us here and now and, and what he asks us to do for the people around us. And this passage talks about laying down your life. I don't always think it means death. But I think it means laying down your stuff. It means sacrificing your time, your energy, your schedule, the things that matter to us. It's to give what we have to meet the needs of those that we care about. And that's Jesus' promise to us. Romans 8.32 says that he who died, he who did not uh, spare his own son, but gave him up for, all, for us all. How did he, <laughs> I'm going to start that over. Romans 8.32 says this, how did he who did not spare his own son, but gave him, gave him up for us all, how will he not also along with him graciously give us all things? This story about Lazarus shows us something about Jesus' heart. The story of Lazarus also tells us something about the power of Jesus. It tells us about the power of Jesus. And I want you to take a minute and, and, and just go through your head. I mean, what are the miracles that you remember that Jesus performed? And consider the miracles of Jesus to understand his power because it's overwhelming. He controls the forces of nature, water, Becomes wine at his command. With a word, the storms, the storms stop. He made water support his own weight. Crowds were fed by food that was multiplied at his command. The Bible teaches that he controls disease and infirmity, that the lame walk, the deaf hear, the blind see, the lepers are cleansed, the sick are made well. The Bible teaches us that he, that he has power over Satan's forces, that demons flee before him, that they shudder at the thought of him, that Satan is, himself is powerless to tempt Jesus. But all of those miracles, all of the glimpses of Jesus' power, I mean, they seem to fall short over what we're talking about right here in Bethany, standing before the tomb of Lazarus. Paul declared in, in 2 Timothy 1.10 that our Savior, Christ Jesus, who, was dis, who has destroyed death and has brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. When Jesus spoke, even death became powerless. Even death is powerless before Jesus and without a doubt, there will be a day when death knocks at your door and you will experience firsthand the same thing that Lazarus did, the powerlessness of death before Christ. And this miracle was the breaking point for the enemies of Jesus. This miracle was the breaking point of the enemies, uh, enemies of Jesus. And they couldn't deny the resurrection of Lazarus and they were scared, they were mad, and they were threatened because of it. And some of the people who saw this, they went to Jerusalem to tell the Pharisees, and it says that the Sadducees, the leaders, the religious, religious leaders of that day, that they called this emergency meeting. And, and John 11, uh, 47 and 48 gives us a little picture of, of what this meeting was all about. This is what it says. It says, that we, what are we accomplishing, they asked. 
Here is this man performing many miraculous signs. And if we let him go on like this, everyone will believe in him. And then the Romans will come and they, take, they will take away both our place and our nation. The religious leaders were afraid for their power and for those who they lorded it over. Caiaphas, the high priest, had an idea also at this meeting. In verse 49 and 50, it says that he told them that it would be better for this one man to die and for, the, for all the people than it would be for this entire nation to be wiped out. And it was right then and right there that it was decided. Verse 53 says it. So from that day on, they plotted to take his life. It was this, it was this miracle, this victory over death, that was the final blow. Jesus would die just as soon as the time and the opportunity presented itself. The story of Lazarus also tells us something about death. The story of Lazarus also also tells us something about death. Because of what Jesus did in Bethany and elsewhere, death doesn't have the force it once did. We see that death's power is broken and death has always been one of our greatest fears. Um, Shakespeare uh, called it the undiscovered country from which no traveler returns. But that's not how it is in Christ. Death has been beaten, its power cut off, and its silence has been lifted. A traveler, Jesus, did return from that undiscovered country. It's the core of the gospel and it's the center of our hope. Jesus spoke through John in Revelation and he said, I am the living one. I was dead, and behold, I am alive forever and ever, and I hold the keys of death and Hades. And while the presence of death remains with us, it's a reality in the world that we live in. Death's power is gone. We also see that death's sting has been removed. Death's sting has been removed. Death might harass us as Christians, but ultimately it can't hurt us. There is a sting that we feel on a human level. And even Jesus felt it as he stood and he wept with Mary and Martha. I mean, he demonstrated his love. He demonstrated the wound that death leaves on us, the genuine hurt that some of us will carry for the rest of our life. But it's not a wound that will last forever. The psalmist knew this even before Jesus came to earth. In Psalm 30, verse 5, this is what it says, that weeping may remain for a night, but rejoicing comes in the morning. And that's the hope that we have in Jesus. That's the promise that we have in him. We also see that death's terror has been unmasked. The mask of the finality of darkness and fear of death has been torn away. In Jesus, we see that death is not not the door to nothingness. Extinction or eternal separation. Instead, in Jesus, death is the gate that opens into eternal life, eternal joy, eternal fulfillment, eternity, foreverness with him. We see that death has been defeated. 1 Corinthians 15, 54 through 57 says this, that, this, that death is swallowed up in victory. Oh, death, where is your victory? Oh, death, where is your sting? For sin is the sting that results in death, and the law gives sin its power. But thank God, he gives us victory over sin and death through our Lord Jesus Christ. And just like Jesus emptied the grave of Lazarus, there will be a day when he empties out every grave. 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 and 7 says this, For the Lord himself will come down from heaven and a, with a commanding shout, with the voice of the archangel and with a trumpet call of God. First, the Christians who have died will rise from their graves and then, together with them, we who are still alive and remain on the earth will be caught up in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air and there we will be with him forever. In Christ, death isn't the same. And I don't know how anybody faces that reality without him. But in him, death can be anticipated without fear. In him, death can be anticipated without fear. The Bible says that that in Christ, death is precious to God. Psalm 116, verse 15 says that precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of the saints. The death of his people is precious to God. It's precious because it's the moment that we, that we come into his presence forever. And because of that, death can be precious in our sight too. In Christ, death is going home. In Christ, death is going home. 
going to the place prepared for us by Jesus himself. John 14, 2 says, Jesus says this, in my father's house there are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you, but I'm going there to prepare a place for you. In Christ, death is gain, and it's not loss. In Philippians 1, and 23, Paul says this, for me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. If I am to go on living in the body, this will mean fruitful labor for me. Yet what shall I choose? I don't know. I'm torn between the two. I desire to depart and to be with Christ, which is better by far. Paul tells us that he's torn, that he longs to, 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 to he longs for what death brings, the realization of his faith. And verse 23 says that he desires to depart and to be with God. Why? Because it was slightly better? Because it was a little better? Paul was saying that it's better by far. Paul is saying have faith because the best is yet to come. 2 Corinthians 5.8, Paul says that we are confident and would prefer to be away from this body and at home with the Lord. And I love that idea, to be home where you belong, where you were created to be with the Lord. In Christ, death means rest from all of our work and struggle and stress. Revelation 14 says, a blessed are the dead who live and then die in the Lord from now on, for they will rest from their labor. In death, we have rest from our labor. Jesus met Lazarus in the darkest valley of his life, the, the valley of the shadow of death, and he led Lazarus out of the dark valley and into the light of life again. It reminds us what we read, right, in, in Psalm 23, and David talked about the valley of the shadow of death, this dark valley of death. And David says that it's a valley in which our shepherd will meet us all one day. We don't know when, we don't get to know where, but it's a valley in which our shepherd will meet us all someday. And when that time comes, Jesus will meet you there the same way that he met Lazarus, out of the darkness of death and into the light of life, but it's not this life. It's the eternal life that waits for those who know him and who have accepted the gift of grace and friendship that he offers. When we look at this piece of history with Lazarus, when Jesus stood in front of the tomb, we learn something of his heart, that he loves us, that he's our friend, that we can count on him to come when we need help. He showed us something of his power, that nothing, not even our greatest enemy, can thwart his ability to help that even death obeys his voice. And he showed us something about death, that in Christ, even death's power is gone. And maybe I'm the only one that views it this way. Sometimes when we come across this topic of death, it's easy to kind of feel like it's a doom and gloom kind of a thing. I want you to hear me clearly that if that's where you're at, you've misunderstood everything that we've talked about because it's exactly the opposite. It's about hope and joy. It's about God's greatness and it's about God's promise. Uh, yesterday, Claudia stopped in my office as I was kind of reworking some of this and she helped me understand something that I was having a hard time putting my finger on. I mean, there's a major theme in Psalm 23. You can also see it in John 11. Yeah, it's about death and it's about God's power over death, but there's another theme that I think you can see really clearly, which is God's presence. God's presence in every area, every phase, every mountaintop, and every valley of our life. And, and I love uh, verse 22 and verse 32 of John chapter 11. I can relate to that. Both Martha and Mary at this point in, in John chapter 11, they say the same thing almost verbatim to Jesus when he first arrived in Bethany. They were scared. They were afraid. And if I read it right, I think they were a little angry. And they basically said, where were you? I mean, if you would have only been here, I think that's what, if you would have only been here, this wouldn't be happening. It's important to understand that Jesus was never unaware. We talked about earlier how in verse three or four, right, that, that Jesus knew that sickness wasn't gonna end Lazarus' life right then and there. That Lazarus would walk. He knew that. Jesus was not unaware. But what they didn't understand, what Mary and Martha didn't understand that, was that Jesus was at work in ways they didn't see that he was revealing parts of himself to them, to the people that were there, 
And I believe even to us here and now. But he knew. He was aware. In my experience, I mean, maybe Jesus doesn't always reveal his presence right when I want it. Or maybe he doesn't always reveal his presence in the ways that I think that he should. But that doesn't mean that it's not there. It didn't mean that for Mary and Martha. It didn't mean that for Lazarus. And it doesn't mean that for me either. How crazy is it to know that the God who created everything, who has power over creation, who has power over illness, who has power over death, is present even now. He's totally aware of you, where you're at, your hurts and your heartache, and even your joy. We can, face, we can face death for what it is because of Jesus' heart, because of his power, because of his victory over it, but also because of his presence. And if we can face death because of his presence, then we can certainly face life because of his presence too. We can face life and all that it throws at us with the same kind of faith and courage that comes from knowing that God walks with us in the deepest and darkest parts of our life and that he cares about what's going on. So take courage. Hold on firmly to the presence of God in your life. Live in it, walk in it, and die in it. Because as Paul said, what's waiting is far better. Let's pray. God, we're grateful for the hope that we have in you. God, that we can tackle a subject that has brought fear to many people for as long as people have been people. God, in sight of what you are and what you've done and the power, God, that you have, we see that even death is helpless. God, help us to live with that kind of confidence and that kind of courage. God, help us to live in your presence Understanding that you're for us. Understanding that you love us. God, help us to understand more clearly the hope that we have in you. We pray that in Jesus' name. Amen.